first of all to say, yeah, that does hurt, so don't play with the electricity at home. Today we're going to be talking about the world's most unique guitar amp. Uh, that's a massive claim, um, but I can say there certainly isn't one more unique than this one. Um, and we're going to find out why. So who's going to be interested in this video today is going to be electronic engineers, audio engineers, an audio producer, anybody that likes a bit of geekery or tech or likes building things or perhaps modifying pedals or things like that. Uh, to give you an idea, my background is uh, 40 years uh, uh, professionally with taking apart uh, mixing desks, audio amplifiers and all that. I'm hoping we can do a little bit of a series if there's some interest be really uh, great to see your comments on there and there is uh, I've got to mention there is a uh, patreon page so of course like subscribe be very grateful on the patreon page as well if you're watching with your family I'm not going to be using any bad words or stuff like that so don't don't worry about having your hand on the space bar uh, because I'm not going to say anything that's um, that that wouldn't be good in a family environment so here it is uh, the baboon and uh, you just heard a little clip of it there Part of this video is about me investigating this as I've had it for almost 30 years, I've gigged it for almost 30 years and it was uh, a very young and enthusiastic man in his early 20s that built this and that young man was me. But I want to see what I did at the time. There's some good ideas in this amplifier and the reason there is is because I had been working for a local music repair store and I worked in all kinds of amplifiers. I wasn't into building a case or that so I just threw away the the the, um, the insides of the Marshall amp and then everything else uh, is, is circuits I designed. That was my thing. So I was always fixing pedals, always fixing amplifiers. Um, and I used to get ideas from that and then I'm quite good at electronics, that's probably a core field for me. So I used to go away and design them. It's also known as the baboon. And this is why, we'll get to why this sticker is here, but I don't know if you can just make that out at the end there, where it says baboon moon in it. So the amp later became to be known as the baboon by people in the band. And you might ask, I've titled the video Parking in the World's Most Unique uh, Guitar Amp. Why did I build the amp? Well, I was living in London at the time playing in various uh, indie or uh, rock or grunge bands or, or 60s retro uh, sort of throwback bands. And, um, and basically the parking was a massive issue. It was a nightmare. We used to play the it was now the garage, I think, or the powerhouse in Islington. It was uh, the Swan and Fulham, places like that. Uh, the Bull and Gate, Kentish Town, Camden Falcon, of course, uh, Dublin Castle in Camden, the Monarch. Uh, one nightmare load in was the King's Head in Putney, and that was a nightmare because it was on a roundabout. So you had to sort of stop in this roundabout. There was a railing and you had to hoik the stuff over the top. So my idea was to get down my gear into a minimal sort of um, uh, uh, configuration. So you could do the load in and, and, you, and you weren't leaving lots of stuff. And also when you were doing sound check, there were usually multi-band nights. So um, what you wanted was to be able to set up very quickly you didn't want lots of plugging up on the stage or bits and bobs, extra pedal boards trying to feed power out to the out to the floor. Um, sometimes I'd be in vocals as well, so you don't want to mess the pedals and all that at the front of the stage. To get around this issue of 
you know, the multi-band nights and having to plug up loads of pedals and everything. And the issue of the one hand here and the parking issue, getting your vehicle stopped in London on red routes and stuff like that. And the railing of pain. Um, you wanted something quick at the front of the stage you could slap down, so I built this. This is, a, I think it's an old Morley volume pedal, but it's all been changed. Actually, it did wah wah, it didn't do volume. Uh, and then you had your switch in for the various effects inside the amp. Uh, these went, this light would come on with a wah wah. This was a sort of spinal tap to 13 sort of fuzz tone. I used to play in this uh, bluesy band um, and volume was, uh, it was quite good. I got a lot of solos. quite high, in fact the highest I got to was once the singer for some reason fired a gun on the stage, Ow! much to my surprise, but that's a story for another day. Uh, then here you had, there was two different types of distortion which we'll discuss. A sort of bluesy one and a more gronky one and um, you could daisy chain them and then there was a phaser and a flanger uh, that they were both stereo as you'll find out the amp is stereo which we'll discuss in detail and then I had two returns here now um, at that time digital delays were available no point in trying to build long delays analog way um, and the price has come down so I had a I think I used to use a quadriverb um, which was very good and sometimes a JHS uh, rack mount 8 bit delay so it's got a nice sort of crumbly sound on it um, but I could switch the well in fact it switches the sends uh, which is what you want so the delay would carry on once you'd stop that you know there wouldn't be any more delay but the the echoes would um, fade away i also used to use a theremin on that return <laughs>
and both of them they were like a mono send and they came back stereo uh, so both channels had a, a stereo uh, we'll talk more about that and this all went back to the amp on this military style connector um, which I'll show you the back of the amp but that plugged in the amp so there's no audio in this no audio came out to the floor um, this was better for the noise and all that but it meant this is the only thing that and my guitar lead that are running out to the front of the stage now I used to do vocals quite a bit as well and uh, what I found over the years was um, it worked better to have the amp at my side when it was mic so your vocal wedge would be in front of you there behind the mic stand of course dead side of the mic you'd be singing but if you put the guitar over to one side facing you that way you got good um, separation because you could hear your guitar without having to have it monstrously loud and that stopped it bothering the rest of the band and also you could hear them from behind you so that, that seemed to work quite well for me um, the amp is quite pokey though that is they're two Celestian I think Sidewinder 12s as I remember I'm not going to open the cabinet because it, it's uh, they're all got gaskets and that it doesn't seem to be much point and they're 8 ohms each the amp's stereo so I think it I'm not really sure but I think it delivers it delivers at least uh, 50 watts a side uh, the amp's capable of doing much much more with a bigger power supply on it but there's no need you know it's a 120 watts out of guitar amp is plenty you just start annoying the sound man and your band uh, really at that volume anyway but the one thing that was um, I did do further down the line as we were doing more mic gigs was if I swing it round apologies for the wobbly camera you'll see it used to be pink and gold for some reason but it's got these fins on the back so you can see there you can lean it back on its pink and gold fins you can still see a hint of the gold I don't know why I you know, sprayed it pink and gold but I think just because there was some pink and gold paint um, it's, it's coming through there but anyway the um, so the two speakers in the front and uh, that way if you have it lent like that as you can see it's more like a fold back wedge but what this means is low frequencies come out and they, they go around like that high frequencies are much more line of sight so if you don't lean your amp back you, you're not really sure what sound you're using so you generally find if you point the speaker towards your ear you'll find you start turning the treble down a bit and that's because you're aiming for the sound you want to hear as opposed to the sound that you can hear um, which is if even if you have the amp up on a crate standing like that the high frequencies go out that way towards the audience and towards the mic that's on the amp but they don't turn up towards your ear and um, I think that's some of the problem why guitar players play too loud so I'm, I'm very very keen on that and always when I was doing live sound to get um, the chaps to to lean the amp back but basically that was it the the speaker uh, the uh, pedal and the head there and that made for a nice carry you know because it's on the casters you could bumble along uh, with your amp guitar and that was it okay we're going to take a look inside the amp okay that's me got the uh, baboon uh, propped up on the bench now we just had a look at the speaker cabinet and the pedal board and just to put it in context, I mentioned already it's I think it's an old Marshall cabinet and um, that was convenient. I put the handle on the end and I love this stuff, pipe insulation. It's nothing worse than getting to a gig and you can't play because your hands are shot to bits. But this was quite good because I could carry it on its end. The original handle was on the top and I could walk with that and that, that made it quite easy to carry and push your speaker cabinet, guitar on your back, all that sort of stuff remember the whole parking thing I was talking about uh, so here we go here's the amp let's start with what you call the signal chain uh, the Stuart Munch you might have noticed there's lots of holes did I take controls out or not no it's just because I didn't have a drill at the time so if I was going to get some drilling done I just drilled all the holes because I used to change things which we'll talk about as we go through 
So I had a lot of fun with the amp, ran a lot of London venues, went on to gig Liverpool a lot as well. I put a few clips of that uh, in there and you can see that. And as I say, probably gigged it about 25 years. So, signal chain, the inputs here. This was a dry output, but it was buffered um, so that you could run other things. I used to run a guitar tuner and a synth, guitar synth from that. Uh, we've got an input gain. This wasn't really so I could get distortion. It was just so that you, you know, if you were using a weak single coil pickup guitar, you could compensate for it. Or if you were using something a bit stronger, um, I used to use an old telly thing that had actually quite powerful pickups on it. Um, so that used to work for that. Important as well because the amp's got a noise gate. Uh, so it's good to get your gain uh, correct on that for the structure. Uh, just simple treble, middle and bass. And after doing a few gigs I realised actually because it's a, a clean you know, IC transistor semiconductor amp it does quite a lot of dynamic range in it which actually is a bit of a nuisance. So this is not really to give you a distorted sound. This control I put on here and it just adds a little bit of, you know, pulls down the, the how high the amp can peak. Uh, and that made it a little bit more usable. And I was playing in amps, playing in bands with other people. They had different sorts of amps. And I began to become aware the big dynamic range wasn't actually that helpful. I had intended to put a compressor in, but I never got around to it. Um, the... This is a soft distortion. This was unusual because it's um, it had an active feedback loop. Now, for those that are a bit more techy, of course, most uh, uh, semiconductor pedals will use some form of diodes uh, to do the clipping or to just hit the power supply rails. This used a, a, an active feedback loop that would just... It, it was active basically so it was responsive this actually when I did more traditional uh, blues case remember one at the Dublin Castle this was this sound was admired by people because um, uh, it was very very usable in that zone sort of screamy lead sound you could switch the EQ in and out and I think I added a tone control there as well uh, so you could switch this EQ section out as I remember um, moving on the phaser now at that time you got the switching channel amps which obviously there was Pro-Amp Vipers I think, uh, Marshalls at that point had switching channels amp. I did a number of conversions on old 60s, 70s Marshalls to make them switching channel amps as well. I know it seems incredible now, probably devalued them totally but at the time people loved it. Um, but the stereo amps available back in the day were certainly the Roland JC120 was probably the most famous Jazz Chorus uh, 120 and um, so this amp is stereo And the stereo comes from the the phaser and the flanger chorus sections. Unusually, not like a lot of other pedals and stuff like that. A lot of other pedals to get stereo, what they took was they took the guitar input and they put it to two outputs in phase. And then they took the wobbly chorus and they maybe put the wobbly chorus to one side 
and just leave the dry guitar on the other or what they might do is they might take the wobbly chorus and put it out of phase so it was sort of doing that between the two speakers that works gives you quite a wide sound of course what happens when you mono it sound disappears or reduces greatly so this was slightly different in the fact that it had two different phaser stages to each side of the amp and the same was true of the chorus flanger you see that's the delay time set there that's uh, what they call regeneration some flangers would call that feedback and then you've got your rate and your depth the regeneration actually goes around both so what uh, both phasers and flangers they work slightly differently but they do what's called comb filtering and that gives you that um, aeroplane passing by um, sound. I'll explain that in greater detail in a later video. But this way you got a sort of maximum stereo from the app and even if you modelled it, if the sound engineer modelled both mics, you'd still get left with the, the chorus wobble and the phaser. Now mother Hubbard went to the cupboard And the cupboard was bare And there was nothing left to sell off and privatise And all the encounters of such and sick has no longer got two hundred pounds for passing go Then there were two stereo send returns for the amp I wasn't interested in building proper delays or echoes or things like that and putting it inside the amp. By that point, you're being able to buy uh, digital delays. And I used to, as you saw in the beginning, if you notice on the top of the amp, there's an old uh, GHS, I think it's 8-bit or it's probably 8-bit um, digital uh, delay that I used to use with the amp. You had an effects send level and effects return. The return stereo so it, it, that control does both sides so you could take that coming back in and there's two of them so you could decide how you want like when the delay comes in you can feed it back into both left and right of the amp or just left or just right and the same idea i used to use a guitar synth coming back in and also i used to use a theremin we'll see if we've got a, a clip of that this was all really simple wanted it simple I used to stack the delay on the top of the amp and I might have a might use a quadriverb sometime with that old GHS delay and then I would use a, um, a guitar synth and a theremin on top of that uh, I'd also often have my Ebo sitting about here And then finally you've got the output volume um, that's the output volume for both both output amplifiers as I say I, I never really bothered testing the power of the amp because it's plenty loud enough um, and that would do I think 50 55 watts a channel so over 100 watts um, uh, which actually it was great you just want the volume that you need for your stage volume really because you know, as I moved on uh, you, you know all the gigs were mic'd anyway this little control here which is unlabeled I added afterwards one of the most successful things about the amp is the fact that it has a noise gate I used to use quite a lot of high gain uh, sounds and um, you know we used to play at quite a high stage volume and of course you get feedback all that sort of thing the noise gate does has no adjustment 
it doesn't need it it works really really well um, and always did as long as you get your input gain set right for the guitar then you don't need to do anything else the only thing is that if you're using a bass it, obviously the noise gate can't open until it's got a signal coming in on the low frequencies of the bass it takes a while for that signal to build up and then if you open the noise gate on it suddenly then you'll get a click so this was put in here just as a little bit of attack time on the noise gate now you've got to follow the logic of this because people go if it opens straight away then you won't get a click that's true it can't open until it's got the signal if you see what I mean so the signal has to get to a certain level and then the gate opens and the trouble is if it suddenly goes like that you get a click having this in there just give it a little tiny slope on that so there was no click if you were using bass if you if you if you um, were using guitar you could just dial it out and you would never hear the click so that's that so we're going to take it out of the box now and um, I think it's just four M0 bolts, well three, what a surprise, uh, on the bottom. I haven't had it open for years, so it's a bit of a journey down memory lane for me. Back with, back with you shortly. Okay, so that's it. She's out of her case. And here's the proof originally, it was a Marshall. Uh, it's just the cabinet that's left, but I think this is a Marshall, what does it say? 100 watt lead. For some reason it's got two labels over there. Blurred probably if I picked that off, we'd see it's irrelevant. Cecilia, if you're out there, it wasn't a great design of amp, the Marshall one, and I apologise for taking your work and throwing it in the bin. But this is more interesting. So just a quick hi to Cecilia. What does that say? There's a date there. That looks like 76. I can't believe it's 76. I don't think that's right. I think it's more 80s, but you never know. Maybe it was 76. Okay, so uh, he, she's out the box and let's turn it over. And at this point, if you're an electronic engineer that builds things, you're going to go, what? And also, um, you're going to be somewhat surprised that I managed to gig this for 25 years. I should say, this is the point where you really understand it's the world's most unique guitar. There isn't another one like it. And basically, it's really a pro prototype well I just used it for years and you've got to remember I built it for myself uh, it was never designed to go into production nor was there any ever any attempt for me to sell the circuits so the circuits are unique they're not they were not taken from other kit and um, let's get this down okay there we are right so we're, we're where I was showing you the label was this end so here's the input there's the preamp and all the effects. We're going to dismantle some of that and then you come over this end. I'm going to start at this end. Uh, reason is that's where the power supply comes in. I'm going to point a, a few things out to you. Um, this was also handy because the handle was at this end. So the big weight of it is the transformers as is always the case. And um, the best thing to do is to have them up near the handle. Um, this is the site of the original transformer, so the original handle was here, so the amp was all off balance in its original design. Um, so the handle's here, so it, it balances quite well as you carry it. Very practical, I am. Um, and, it's, and it's great thinking that you want to lug a Marshall 200 watt amp to a pub gig. Fantastic, you know, how many times a week are you going to do that and still enjoy it? Now you want the easiest thing possible. Um, so none of this, uh, well I said it's a Marshall case, none of it is Marshall it's possible the mains transformer is the original one but I don't think so, what does it look like, yeah plus or minus 60 volts probably that's going to give you is, don't know what it's saying, 117, yeah something like that, don't know Um. so, oh no, the plus or minus 36, here we are or it's not plus or minus, obviously it's AC coming out of the transformer but but it, it, that'll end up with, I don't know what the voltage rails end up being, but they'll be of the order of, you know, high 40s, 50s maybe. Um, so as you come round here, you'll also notice there's an extra transformer in here. Uh, that is because the, the power amps, these two things which I'm going to talk about, 
the power outs require a, a, a high voltage as you know so you probably find like I say let's just call it plus or minus 50 and um, that's that bit I did which was ridiculous actually at the time originally I used a different way of powering this board uh, but then I decided to go for a separate transformer and this provides I don't know what the voltage rails or the effects on the preamp board are I don't think they're very high actually um, I can't remember uh, uh, and obviously it doesn't actually take that much current because you can see that the voltage regulators are not on heat sinks the eagle eyed of my vintage will have spotted these amplifier modules and will be saying oh you just told us it was the world's most unique amplifier and yet right well the and yet is these modules were readily available in UK and they were an absolute bargain there's no point in designing a power amp for a transistor ampli uh, amplifier with guitar amp really these are MOSFET modules they were available for about under 25 pounds 20 to 25 pounds and they're actually each capable of 120 watts they're just not powered enough so so you could end up with a 240 watt guitar amp <coughs> actually that's nonsense it's no use whatsoever it's just a, a thing to annoy sound men drummers and vocalists in particular so I just kept it uh, with the lower voltage rails and each of these amps will deliver into uh, four ohms oh and there's some interesting that's very unlike me I've written some details there about the where the FETs go off which is probably the noise gate oh and I've written some other things so these must probably the voltage rails plus minus 51 plus minus 15 plus minus 9 okay so these are on plus minus 50 these modules are slightly modified never really had any problem with it but once you can see that's why this resistor is up here and the modules were modified to take in a large earth into the center of the circuit board they were known for having just a little bit of murmur meaning a, a very slight low level hum that was annoying and this uh, depreciated that um, so that was a mod for that uh, there's some terrible workmanship here which you can see that is supplying a high voltage out towards I think the pedal board to drive the lights and all that switching could have done that better um, this board I replaced with proper voltage regulation a lot of uh, guitar amps at that time it wouldn't bother with that uh, they would just use the Zener diode way of coming down from the 50 plus minus 50 and uh, that would do, end up using a lot of power for no reason certainly in a thing like this um, but that's all proper regulated once I got that in there it worked well never really had a problem with failure I think when this failed it wasn't an issue um, because of course you got the other amp so the speaker, the speaker can that's got two 8 ohm speakers in it, so you can run it, two 8 ohm speakers, distinct, or you can run it as one 4 ohm or one 16 ohm. That's all available on the back of the cabinet for you, uh, just by various sockets, so you don't need to do very much with that. Um, but I used to have these running out into two 8 ohm speakers, so I don't know what power I used at the gigs, as I say. Um, so other things to point out, that's we talked about that large connector that goes out to the footboard. Other things here, there's your speaker outputs, one for one side, one for the other. And then a really dodgy bit of ribbon cable that goes over here. And that had a headphone socket on it. Um, because I used to live in a flat in London, so that let me use the amplifier uh, into headphones. And there's a couple of pad resistors there to stop you blowing your head off. Um, at this end, let's see. As we come up here, there's a whole load of sockets. Now, what these are, I believe, right, let's work back. That's input to the power amp, and that's um, the output from the preamp and all the effects. So, that's like a send return that you were getting a lot of amplifiers. But it also meant I could, if I just wanted to use the power amps, I could plug in here. 
also if I wanted to use this section as a preamp I could just plug stuff in there to mute the speakers or in fact with a transistor amp you never do it with valve amps or uh, an amp that has output transformers you could in fact just um, disconnect the output speakers um, so there's a send return for the left and right amps and then you had two sends up here that came from the preamp and then two two returns left right one left right two as I remember it wasn't very good at labeling things and these had their own return volume controls and their own send levels so it didn't matter what you were using, whether it was a little guitar box or a studio signal processor, you could get a level there that would suit that. So that's that. And as we discussed already, there's your input jack. Below it is a, a, a buffered output for the tune of the guitar synth. And you can see here, do you see there's a whole load of capacitors and bits and bobs and stuff tied on. I used to come back from a gig and I said, oh, I wasn't quite happy with the sound, so I might do things. I might just add bits and bobs on. There's some more here, you know. Now, this is where those of you that do electronics will be going, what? And the reason they're probably going, what, is this is strip board. This was a way of constructing electronics and prototyping them, really. You could build projects with it. And it just has a whole load of copper strips that head in this direction. So you put the components in. This, uh, uh, for example, this is about as densely packed as strip board gets. And it's lunacy. Um, fortunately, it's never really gone wrong. So, um, But you can see there all the components. I'll be pointing out what they are. And you see all the wires here. Very careful, there's no nonsense. All this stuff... Anything that's not supplying DC voltages or switching voltages has got its own shielded cable. And that was kind of quite important because you had a lot of gain from here to here. So, you, you know, if you, were, if you were ramping things up, then, um, you know, it would have oscillated if you hadn't done that. So there's actually two boards. I don't know if you can see that. There's another one under here. I'm going to take them apart now so that you can see them and um, <clears throat> and we'll run through what, what's done. I don't think I've had these out of here for goodness knows how long. So yeah, just going to take this apart. I've taken some screws out and uh, if you're enjoying the video, um, do hit like, subscribe and uh, you can find the Kelta Patreon page in the links. Um, anyway, so I said there's two boards here. If I lift this off, you'll see there's one underneath as well. Oh look, some space. So I left some space. So one board is stacked above the other and you can see I deliberately, so that I could lift the boards out, all the wires come off one end. And that's the back of the strip board. Let me turn the light a little. Don't know if you can see that. A lot of soldiering went on there, and where there hasn't been space, or I've added something, I've put it on the other side of the board. So if we come down, I, I'm not sure I'm going to take this board out because that's a fiddle, but there's no boards underneath this one. Um, up here, I think this is all the switching stuff, and in terms of switching, there was voltage signals came in from the floor controller that I showed you and what would happen is those voltages many of them would end up to, to driving a whole load of FET switching here so I think all the switching for all the different effects occurs here by and large the FET switching worked really well it's very common of course Boss were probably the first people to really hit the market that in a massive way Nice noiseless switch and you can do different things. Also allowed me the ability to perhaps switch two things at once or stuff like that, um, which I did. Now on this board, let's start with this board as the lower board. Let me see what we've got. Right. This looks like this is the output stage. And then there's some other stuff to do with how the wah-wah works. Remember, 
the Wawa's got no audio on this thing, so you had to send a control signal in and it drove various types of oscillators. It's quite clever how the Wawa worked. Uh, I'd like to change it actually, but and that, I think up here, this section here is the Wawa. And uh, for those that are in the know, you know, there's a lot of chat about the different types of inductor you would use and all the rest of it. I had a, a friend, um, pal, and I before I had this amp, I used to he used to lend me his Wawa pedal, which was just because it was it was an old I think it was a yen. I really liked it, uh, and I used to use a lot of different Wawa pedals, especially when I've been working in previous years fixing things. And so what I did was uh, well, in fact, together we used a circuit modeling program, which was in DOS. This is going back in the nineties, and we recreated the circuit. But I wanted rid of the inductor. Because you've got this big coil of wire, you know, inside the Wawa. And as you bang the Wawa, it's so microphonic uh, uh, as soon as you're using high gain sounds. I didn't want that. So this uses a, a, a different circuit. And it, and, and it, is, it is exactly a replication of the Yen Wawa, but if you like, with everything replaced. Uh, which might sound a bit funny, but the, the architecture of the design is the same. And in fact, we because of our jobs, we had access to a proper uh, test set and kit, and we used to do analysis and all that, and check the position, you know, where the wah wah was. We used to check the sound and all that sort of stuff to exactly mimic the other one, and that's how that worked. So, so that works with the, that needs a little bit of work at the moment, as you can see. There's any amount of alignment tweaks here. Uh, for and that was just the Wawa. Now, over here, I suspect this might be the preamp section and one of the fuzzes. Just having a wee look. This is a real trip down memory lane. Thank you for indulging me. Well, look at that. It's a whole bunch of diodes here. Ah, right. Okay. I know where we're going with that. That is one, I think these two are the, are the various distortion uh, things. I think this one is possibly the active distortion feedback loop and this one's a more sophisticated um, way of using diodes. Again, it's something we ran in the circuit simulator um, to do that. So that's that board. There's some clock signals mounted away and again, oscillator signals. I don't think that stuff is in the signal path. There was a necessity for a couple of high frequency oscillators uh, to do various things. One clock frequencies for the bucket brigade delay line uh, which was a pre-digital method of, of delay. It was very difficult until digital came along to delay signals by any significant amount. You could delay them for very very short times using what they call all pass filters. Um, but that really wasn't enough to get any achievable effect. Of course, the first delay effects, hence the name flanging, came from pushing on the flange of the tape rail as it went round. So that's how that developed. The phaser was a filter thing, but it worked slightly differently. But in order to get delays at that time, you had to really, the only option was to use a bucket brigade delay line. Those needed a clock frequency to clock the signal through, so on a pulse it would send it. And why it's called a bucket brigade delay line is it would sample the signal. Now we think in terms of sampling as being digital, but it would sample the analog level and it would pass it along to the next uh, capacitor. Uh, the, you know, they do work and people sort of seem to like the sound of it. Very complicated uh, you got to be careful to get all the filtering right. You get these things called aliasing, which is like a sort of whistling radio set sound. Uh, and in fact, um, there, there were issues with that because the amp is so complicated and it, and it feeds signals around. You could get aliasing noises out of it. I never found that problem. I used it in uh, various studios uh, at the time. Uh, in fact, indeed, did some stuff at Torag uh, Vintage Recording Studio, which is I think which went on to be quite famous with the White Stripes, 
um, for its retro thing. They also did some stuff at a place Ireland had over in West London, but I use the amp for all that stuff. This one, my friends, is called Talking Bible. <laughs> So the top board, and I'll see if I can find some shots of these things. So the top board, let's work out what we've going on here. Well, I can tell straight away, these are clocking chips and they clock the two bucket brigade delay lines here. The two bucket brigade delay lines are not operating at the same frequency. This is very important. Uh, they have separate clock signals. This means that the delay you can get out of it is not an, an exact mathematical multiple of the two things. So if you use the same clock frequency, let's say for example the first delay line is delaying at 30 milliseconds, then the second delay, delay line would delay another 30 milliseconds. That's not how this works. Both clock frequencies were set to be slightly different. Uh, this meant that the the delays out the the left and right of the amp were slightly different. They weren't mathematical multiples. Uh, in here, you can see goodness knows what these do. What's that chip there? Goodness knows what these presets are for. Oh, it might be a gain adjust for something, perhaps to control the balance of the phaser. I think this is the phaser section. And the phaser section used, it didn't use FETs, that's all I'm going to say, didn't use FETs. Uh, but it does work, uh, which you might hear later if I can find a good clip. Uh, so the flanger chorus up here, um, no longer delay than that because you can't get that out of delay lines. The phaser section here, which is, there's a lot of stages in the phaser. And again, that was tapped out at different places to give you a stereo. It wasn't just one side of it inverted, flipped, uh, so you had a 180 degrees phase on the speaker. Uh, then over here, what have we got? Well, I'll, I'll leave that one as a clue for for the geeks amongst us that know IC numbers and chip numbers. Um, some switching, what's up this end? I think that might be the input preamp here, but to be honest, I've got no idea. And nor have I got any idea what these things do. Actually, I think that might be the Wawa. I think that might be the Wawa. Anyway, that's it. That's a sort of overview of the amp. Uh, it, the amp did work really well. I only had two problems. This power amp, I think this resistor burnt out. And... Um, there was, I think, on the base of the other board, there's a large capacitor that has to be there. And it fell off once, uh, which was fine. Didn't cause me any problems. It was, I think it was to do with the Wama. Um, but there's one thing from the places I learned is you want to uh, be careful of your electrical safety. So you'll notice, I knew I was going to work on the amp a lot. So you'll see here things are insulated. You know I've covered up the wires. Dangerous voltages. So uh, these things. But also notice I mentioned it already. There's a mains fuse that's always got to be in the live and the the higher voltages um, which are about 50 volts again they are fused separately. Now you wouldn't normally, I screened the top here, uh, hard to screen this bit, but you, you don't necessarily need to, there's a certain, you know, 50 volts is below what's considered dangerous. So that's it basically, I would say the most 
unique guitar amp in the world. There's probably others that are as unique, um, but there's certainly none like this. As I say, all this bit of it was designed and built, every single component, every little bit of architecture. I got a couple of power amps off the shelf, no point in reinventing the wheel. And uh, they served me very well. And that's it. The baboon.